Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Clean Lakes Alliance virtual Clean Lakes 101 Science Cafe. I'm Eric Waite. I'm a commercial banker at Johnson Financial Group. I'm also on the planning committee for the Four Lakes golf event, and I hold a board position with CLA. Along with the First Weber Foundation, Johnson Financial Group is proud to once again sponsor these talks. Joining us today are supporting sponsor, National Guardian Life Insurance Company, the Edgewater, who would be hosting all of these talks if we were doing them in person, uh, and our production partners, the University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, the UW Lakes Extension. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. Uh, first, it's a new year, which means Clean Lakes Alliance has kicked off its new annual campaign. If you haven't donated to become a lake friend, which is an individual donation, or a lake partner, which is a business or organization donation, please visit cleanlakesalliance.org slash donate. On the screen now is a list of lake partners that have joined or renewed just this month. This year's annual campaign goal is $1.2 million. All of the money raised from donations goes directly towards important lake improvement projects and volunteer lake monitoring, as well as community educational programs like this one. Second, uh, I wanna remind everybody about salt use on driveways and sidewalks. Our friends at SaltWise have some excellent tips on how to reduce your outdoor salt use to help the lakes. Believe, believe it or not, a cup of coffee of salt, I'm sorry, not don't use coffee on your driveway. A, a coffee cup of salt is enough to cover an average residential driveway. Also keep in mind, if it's as cold as it is today, don't use salt because it actually won't work. Uh, wait until the temperature is above 15 degrees to use salt to melt ice on your driveway or walkway. All right, sorry, back to today's talk titled Love in the Lakes, which is appropriate because Valentine's Day is just a few days away. Here to tell us a little more about today's program and to introduce our speaker is Paul Tyson from National Guardian Life Insurance Company. Paul? Thanks, Eric. As Eric said, National Guardian Life Insurance is proud to be a supporting sponsor of these talks. Like Johnson Financial Group, NGL also supports Clean Lakes Alliance through event sponsorships, board members, and an annual volunteer day. Uh, actually, through a program Clean Lakes Alliance had in 2017 called the Ohio Watershed Academy, we were able to start a green team at NGL. Since then, we've had a number of projects, including the e waste drives, salt application education, rain barrel distribution, and compost collection. Uh, today's talk, titled Love in the Lakes, takes a look at how fish, plants, and other organisms reproduce in our lakes. In some cases, it's a difficult process that seems nothing short of amazing. Here to, pre here to present today's topic is Justin Shenevert from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Justin, originally from Boston, got his start in the field by hauling laundry baskets of invasive weeds from the Charles River. He moved to Madison in 2013 and obtained a master's in water resource management from UW's Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. He currently works for the DNR in the water monitoring section, but prior to that, Justin worked for Clean Lakes Alliance on a variety of watershed projects. Please welcome Justin Shenevert to tell us a little more about today's interesting topic. Thanks for that um, introduction. I um, hope everybody is, uh, is settled in with um, their coffee or beverage of choice today. And uh, bearing the cold well. All right. So yeah, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, we'll be talking about love in the lakes or uh, an overview of aquatic reproduction strategies. Um, this is actually how bluegill mate. They kiss on the lips and then little heart-shaped bubbles from, form from that and they pop and a tiny baby fish is there. So that's, that's a start. Um, so we're actually going to focus on four different species today, you know, all of which reside in the Ahara chain of lakes here in Madison. Um, and 
you know, some of these species are ones we hope are reproducing often and successfully, and some are not. Um, some are species we, we hope that they don't actually find love in the lakes, in our lakes anyway. Um, but for both the species that, you know, we humans enjoy and the ones that cause us problems, um, I think looking at reproduction and their reproductive strategies can help us as we, um, you know, manage these lakes and the natural world around us. There we go. Um, so we'll be, you know, kind of thinking about some guiding questions today um, for each of these species. We can think about how this, their reproductive strategies are different from one another. We can think about um, how that particular strategy helps the species succeed in its environment. What obstacles to reproduction must the species overcome? And uh, what does this mean for our relationship with the species? So we'll talk about northern pike, the iconic game fish, um, very successful species widespread across North America, of course, holds a, a special place in our hearts here in Madison as um, we have a, a really great uh, trophy pike fishery on the Madison lakes. Um, and, and really the pike is a iconic species for Wisconsin, um, especially for anglers. Um, and it's a, you'll see just really how interesting they are. We'll also talk about bluegill, another very successful widespread species across North America, but one that um, again, you can find uh, abundant in the Madison area lakes. Um, and it's another fish, but we'll get into exactly how it's different than pike and um, how uh, just a few small differences um, will really uh, make a big difference in their overall reproductive strategy. We'll move away from fish and talk about Daphnia, um, very small crustacean that is kind of the tiny grazers of our, um, the Hara chain of lakes here. And lastly, we'll, we'll talk about a bad guy. We'll uh, discuss zebra mussels. So the, uh, one of the probably more successful invasive species um, that the Midwest has encountered. Um, and um, we've, we've been dealing with zebra mussels for um, a very long time. And um, honestly, they're probably not going anywhere soon. So it's best that we learn about them and how they reproduce. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we'll begin with pike. Um, so let's start by taking a look at adult pike. Um, these are large uh, predatory fish that um, very, uh, even at a young age, start transitioning to eating other fish as like their primary um, source of food. Um, they're solitary hunters and the shape of the, the pike there and the, the top picture is, you know, kind of torpedo shaped and that suits them. Um, it helps them be effective ambush predators. Um, so they're going to use like the, that body shape to quickly dart at prey. They'll often cruise along uh, weed edges um, to kind of look for smaller fish that might be vulnerable to a quick attack. Um, and I'll, I'll point out that um, if you've ever seen a pike come out of a lake here in Madison, um, you'll know that they can get very, very large. Um, so two to three feet is not uncommon. And, you know, the trophy size pike um, can, can get even larger, um, 40 plus inches. So when a pike is that big, um, there's really nothing that can eat it. Um, even coming up to, to two feet, there's very, very few, you know, other fish that would even try to to eat that pike. Um, so as adults, they're pretty much invulnerable to, to being uh, eaten at least. Um, so for pike, I think, uh, let's start by thinking about how, uh, how can you give your young the best chance to grow to this size? So when pike are starting out, they're, you know, they're very, very vulnerable. Um, this is a pike embryo with the, the eyes are at the bottom right hand side of the photo and um, the spine of the pike kind of curves away from you. Um, and the, those two large circles in front are yolk sacs. Um, and so this um, egg floating around in a lake um, would kind of look like a Reese's cup to a lot of um, predators, even in, you know, invertebrate predators might be big enough to eat this and, and uh, you know, the pike would not survive. Um, so, you know, this is a very defenseless, very young pike. Um, how does it get to be to the size where it's basically invulnerable to predation? 
and overall the the strategy that pike use oh i'll, I'll also mention so the pike the strategy that pike are going to use is they're going to provide the young with a really good nursery um and so they're going to grow from the egg that we just saw to something on the left where they're just uh, using up the, the yolk sac there um, and and beginning to feed on their own and then something on the right hand side um, is a few weeks or months later and so even though that pike on the right is still very very small it's already gotten big enough that there are some fish that can no longer uh, fit it down their gullet so even just growing to that size takes a, a, some predators out of the equation um, and so you know, as if you're a pike that size, you'd want to hope to continue growing, make it through your first winter, um, and then become a predator yourself. Okay, so I talked about the strategy of pike is going to be to provide a good nursery. And here is um, what that kind of looks like. Um, so in the spring, when water temperatures are about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the pike will start looking for a place like this, and they will kind of seek out warmer water. Um, you know, the, the water that's going to be warming the quickest are these kind of shallows um, up against edges of lakes and pike will go to some pretty um, extraordinary lengths just to find a place like this. They really don't want to spawn, you know, in a, in a deep cold lake. They want to go up into the shallows. Um, they'll even swim through places um, you know, against current. They'll swim under ice to get to something like this. Um, the males will usually arrive at the spawning site first then followed by the females and the females will deposit eggs um, in several different places. So that's already part of the strategy is to literally not put all your eggs in one basket or in this case, patch of vegetation. Um, so the males will follow the females and fertilize the eggs. Um, and then the, the adults will depart and the young are on their own, except that they've been given kind of like, again, like a nursery habitat. So we'll go under the water and um, Two things I'll point out about this nursery is I already mentioned that these places are going to be warming faster than uh, the rest of the lakes. Um, so the shallow water, you know, is going to be warmed more quickly by the sunlight. Um, and that's really crucial for developing fish because the temperature of the water that you're in um, generally determines how fast um, you grow as long, you know, as long as there's abundant food around. Um, and so, you know, if the, if the pike um, get lucky and they, they place their eggs here and there's a good um, bunch of zooplankton to start those pike out, then they do really well and they can grow quickly. And remember, they want to grow quickly just to get even a little bit bigger to make it a little bit harder to be eaten. Um, and the other thing about this habitat is that there's this submerged vegetation. You, you can see that it's not all alive. Um, so maybe these were some reeds or something that got flooded and died. Um, but the pike will, will have sticky eggs and the eggs will stick to this vegetation. Um, and that's a very purposeful strategy too, because you don't want your eggs to fall down into the um, kind of silty sediment there, um, because then they will likely be starved of oxygen. And that's also something really important for you know, developing fish, just like lots of animals and aquatic animals, um, you need a steady supply of oxygen. So the stickiness of the eggs is also part of the strategy because it keeps them um, more likely to be oxygenated by the moving currents here. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the pike, you know, part of the strategy is they don't, um, the parents don't really stick around after the fertilization of the eggs, but they've kind of given their young a, a good um, head start, hopefully, by starting so early in the spring, choosing the warmest area, you know, relative to the rest of the lake, um, where they can start developing very quickly and hopefully um, reach that size and then begin eating fish themselves. So even though, you know, even though the site selection is really important, most fish are not going to survive. They won't get to grow to this size. Um, but the few that do, um, you know, a pike this large is going to produce a really impressive amount of eggs or sperm. Um, and interestingly, you know, if you look at a pike that's 15 inches long and a pike that's 30 inches long, you know, the pike that's twice as long isn't producing twice as many eggs, it's producing something more like 10 times as many eggs. So again, getting bigger um, allows you to kind of exponentially increase um, the, the, your investment in reproduction. Um, and so that fact is something that, you know, as humans, we think about 
um, when we do things like design a, the regulations for a fishery, um, you think about you know not only how many pike are in the lake, but of what sizes you want to keep or, or allow anglers to keep and how many of these large pike you want to keep around um, to keep reproducing every year because pike can live for um, you know a decade more than a decade and so they'll have plenty of opportunities to to reproduce and um continue to to produce more pike and get you know have that natural reproduction occurring and the other the other thing i'll point out is that that site um, i showed you earlier um that is basically a wetland um so if you you know Humans have historically removed many wetlands across the United States and in Wisconsin as well. And so, you know, to have a really great um, trophy pike fishery with natural reproduction occurring, it's really important to protect wetlands, especially those that are um, right up against lakes, you know, and connected to other bodies of water. So we'll, we'll have a little uh, ch chart here and we'll add pike in the first row. So they produce um, many, many eggs only a few of them survive, but um, they kind of give them a little bit of a boost by finding a really good nursery. And remember that, you know, the adult pike are spending time and energy to go find a good place. Um, so that, that comes at a cost. Obstacles to success is the biggest one is probably habitat loss. And it's those, you know, wetlands that are connected to other bodies of water that are going to provide, remember that submerged vegetation and really shallow uh, water um, that can, that is the best pike spawning habitat. So now let's move on to bluegill. Um, so again, looking at an adult bluegill, you'll notice the body shape of the fish is totally different. Um, so these are, you know, pan fish because they fry up nicely in a pan. Um, and they're going to have a totally different strategy than pike. So this is, you know, the mouth is a lot smaller. This bluegill um, can eat aquatic insects fairly easily, but it's, there's very, very, very few other fish that it could encounter that it's going to try and um, it's going to try and eat. And you might think, well, this adult bluegill is going to be um, easy target for a pike or a muskie, right? Um, but it's actually the the strategy of the adult bluegill is to grow kind of vertically and make it just very difficult for the pike to to fit that down its throat. And that's what those spines on top are doing. It can flare those out. Um, during danger and try to basically make itself difficult to swallow. So even though the bluegill is a lot smaller, it grows in the vertical direction um, to try and just get big enough that it's um, that's not going to be um, it's going to be very difficult to be eaten. Um, so again, they just want to get their young growing, growing as quickly as possible. But they're going to be different than pike. They um, they're going to provide more parental care, which is really interesting. But there's a there's there's a caveat. Not all the males um, want to put in the hard work of parenting. I'll leave you to make your own jokes about that at home with the people you're with. So, bluegill um, spawn a little bit later in the spring than pike. They're waiting until water temperatures are around 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the males start building little nests um, with their snouts and tails. Um, so these those are the circular kind of craters on the uh, bottom right hand side uh, side of the slide. Um, and you'll notice that there are many craters in this small area. So they're actually doing it together in a kind of little colony. Um, so right away, that's part of the strategy um, is to nest together. Um, that gives you a um, little bit of heads up if there's predators around. Um, but like anything, it's a trade off. So um, there is actually some bluegill that will choose to make their nest away from the rest of the colony. And the, the theory there is that it's to avoid a potential fungal infection, something that could spread very quickly through a bunch of nests that are close together. Um, but some bluegill will try to nest away um, because of that threat. So some, again, I, I want to start everybody thinking about the idea of trade-offs. You know, it, it, there's some good things to being in a colony, but also some downsides. Okay, but most males are, are participating in the colony. They're um, doing hard work, you know, clearing small areas, you know, um, using tails and snouts, or so they're investing energy in that. Um, and basically, they're trying to create a nest that a female will find attractive, and the female will say, "Yeah, I'll put I'll put my eggs in here," and the male will fertilize them. 
and um, the males will care for the young for about 10 days. Um, the eggs will get fertilized and hatch in a few days, and then they'll actually, the males will stay around um, and guard the young fry for a while. So here's a, a bluegill nest, um, and we're going to get into the kind of the exception to the rules here. So the largest fish you see is a parental male bluegill. So um, he spent time clearing that depression. Um, if there are any eggs there, he would fan them with his tail to provide oxygen again and um, guard from potential predators. Um, so males will actually um, lose about 10% of their body weight between building the nest and guarding for the young. So it's, again, it's, a, it's an investment in reproduction that um, places the individual at risk, right? Because if you're losing body weight, um, you know, maybe you're less likely to make it through the winter. Maybe you um, are more susceptible to disease or something. So what if you could fertilize the eggs without spending all the time and energy uh, building the nest and protecting the eggs and fry? Um, so re researchers have found that there are some males, um, which is, it's kind of hard to see, but there is a very small fish on the bottom called a sneaker male. Um, and they will, they will try to sneak in there after eggs have been deposited by a female and fertilize some of them and then take off and try to leave the parental male with all the work. Um, so obviously the larger males will kind of bully the sneaker away if they, if they find out, but if you succeed, if you manage to fertilize these eggs and then leave and your young get taken care of by someone else, it's a really great um, strategy to way to pass on your genes because one, that sneaker male has not invested um, all the time and energy in the nest and in guarding. And so they're free to forage and continue to grow. And also they're, um, they're small, not just because of they're slightly different than the other males, but because they're younger. So you get to reproduce at a younger age, which is you know, potentially an advantage um, to try and pass on as, as many of your genes as possible. So it's not a bad strategy overall. And the sneaker males, like the one at the bottom, will grow into something um, that looks like that fish on the upper left. And it's actually mimicking female coloration. So there's, they change their strategy a little bit, but as they get bigger, um, they try to start to mimic females and hope that the larger parental male will let them near the nest to again, try and sneakily fertilize some eggs. Um, so that, so, so they have a kind of, a, you know, unethical strategy perhaps, um, but the parental males have a way to fight back against this. Um, so they researchers have found you can actually, um, the parental male somehow um, either through chemical cues or visual or um, other kinds of cues can figure out um, roughly how many of the fish of the fry that it's guarding are its own offspring. And if you knew that most of those uh, fry were not your own offspring, you might invest, if you were a fish and kind of mean, you might invest a lot less energy into protecting those young. So they found that actually um, if a large male um, is guarding a, a brood that is mostly um, someone else's offspring, they'll actually leave, abandon those fry earlier and go and try and nest again. Um, to try and pass on their genes. So you can see this kind of competition happening between two different types of uh, male parental strategies in bluegill. So now I'm gonna speculate a little bit. This is just me um, thinking on my own, but I would suspect that if you were an angler on the Madison Lakes um, and you were looking for bluegill to fry up in a pan, you would probably maybe throw back the smaller uh, sneaker males and probably keep the larger parental males for your meal. Um, but obviously the sneaking strategy only works if there are already plenty of parental males to make the nests, right? So it, again, it's kind of this it's competition between these two different strategies. One can't survive without the other, but um, if there's a ton of parental males in a population, then there's really that evolutionary pressure um, to maybe adopt that sneaking strategy. So thinking about our relationship with the species, I mentioned my um, very unscientific theory that perhaps we're removing more parental males than otherwise, but also just to remember that the, um, these fish are nesting very close to shore. And so, you know, our um, activities on the shoreline and in the watershed are potentially um, 
potentially very important for you know how the nesting goes for these bluegill. Um, so you know if there's surface runoff happening nearby, um, you know that could be uh, detrimental to those nests. I mean, if you just built a nest and it gets covered in muck again, um, you might lose your entire bunch of eggs there or the, the brood. So especially thinking about, you know, how we can protect these fish when they're at this very vulnerable stage where they can't move um, and, they're, and they're stuck kind of protecting their young, that can give us a way to, you know, improve a fishery or protect it for the long run. All right, so back to our little uh, summary slide here. Um, bluegill actually produce an impressive amount of eggs um, and start out with thousands of fry. Again, survival is pretty low, um, but it's a little bit better than pike um, because they're providing, you know, the, the males are fanning the eggs and making sure they're getting oxygen and also um, protecting them for a few days there to get them kind of a, a head start. Um, obstacles are probably also, you know, that habitat loss um, in the, or potentially, you know, runoff in the near shore area. And I'd encourage everybody, if you get a chance in the spring um, to go around maybe shorelines where there, there aren't a ton of aquatic plants, you might be able to see some of these bluegill nests and they're, it's pretty fascinating. Okay, so now we're moving away from fish. Um, we have Daphnia. Um, when I say Daphnia, there's actually you know, many uh, Daphnia species. We actually have several in the Madison Lakes. Um, and they're very small crustaceans that are going to graze on microscopic uh, plants in the water column. Um, so they're going to use, there's kind of, uh, they have little arms there, kind of feathery arms that they can, they can kind of jerk them downward and swim around. Um, so they are mobile and they're um, looking for food, but they're also getting eaten. Um, they're prey for larger invertebrates and, and some fish. Um, but they're very short-lived um, compared to the fish we were just talking about. So it's a matter of months. So they have to take advantage of the good times when conditions are right. And they have a strategy to do this. Okay, so we have to spend a little bit of time on this particular slide. Um, but basically, um, Daphnia can reproduce sexually. So combining genetic information from two different individuals, and that all gets scrambled up and creates a new individual, um, which is what was going on with bluegill and pike. They undergo sexual reproduction, but they can also undergo asexual reproduction. Um, so that is that inner loop there that says parthenogenic cycle. And what that is, is that's a female Daphnia um, can produce eggs on its own and produce more daughters, which in turn can produce um, more eggs on their own. So that Asex, that is asexual reproduction, meaning the daughters are essentially clones of the mother Daphnia. Um, and right away, you can see um, that that's going to be very quick. So, um, the, you know, the mother begins developing the eggs, um, and it's a matter of weeks before they give birth to a more uh, genetically identical daughter Daphnia. And those daughters can immediately start producing their, or not immediately, but very quickly start developing their own eggs, and you have kind of an exponential population growth in that case. Um, and so, so if you were Daphne, you might want to do that um, if there's a ton of food around and just grow your population a ton, um, again, pass on your genes at that point through the very quick asexual reproduction. So why would you need sexual reproduction at all? Um, well, eventually, you know, with exponential population growth, you, you will run into a problem. Um, you might run out of food, or you might begin um, as a little Daphne living in Lake Mendota to experience a Wisconsin winter, like we're experiencing right now. Um, and so they're very, they are sensitive to um, kind of cues as far as temperature and, and day length and how much food is around and, and how many predators are around. Um, so that's a potential pop a problem for exponential population growth. And also, if your population is entirely cloned, so everyone is genetically identical, um, then every individual is going to be equally susceptible to an infection or a parasite or some other genetic disadvantage. You know, there might be some genetic advantages, but if there's a disadvantage, usually something eventually figures out how to take advantage of that and your entire population could crash. Okay, so 
the out kind of the outer circle is how Daphnia um, reproduce sexually. So the, the females can also produce parthenogenic sons, which can then mate with um, daughters from a different lineage, and they produce eggs. Um, so the Daphnia at the top of the figure has mated with a male, and it's producing two um, sexually produced eggs. So those eggs are new genetic individuals that have genes from you know that have been scrambled genes basically from the mother and the father um and so you know basically based on random chance there is likely no other daphnia like those those ones in the eggs there the other really important thing about the sexually produced eggs is that they they're encased in this hard shell and that will um shed with the next time the daphnia molts so like other crustaceans it molts um and that will sink to the bottom of the lake and it can actually remain viable there for more than 100 years. So right now at the bottom of Lake Mendota, there are undoubtedly Daphnia eggs, maybe even from 1900, sitting down there waiting for the perfect time to hatch. Um, so like I said, the sexual reproduction could be triggered by colder temperatures or, or bad conditions and the females will sense this, start producing males and you get a, a cycle of sexual reproduction going on. And so the next spring, some of the eggs hatching, some will be from the previous year, but some might be from 20 or 30 years ago. And that kind of gives the population coming up in the spring a, a little injection of genetic diversity from the past, which is kind of an interesting thing. And we'll, we'll, we'll see how that could be important. Okay, so here we've got two Daphnia. Uh, the one on the left has those asexually produced eggs You'll notice there's, it looks like there's about five in there. Whereas on the right, um, you have the sexually produced eggs in the casing there, and there's only two of them. So that's, that's, that's right away kind of a, another uh, difference between those two strategies. Um, and I also, I don't have anything to say for this picture, but I found it at the last minute and it's very, very cool. It is, you know, Daphnia giving birth. So, um, uh, I just thought everybody needed to see that. Very cool. Um, and you'll notice actually these are different species of Daphne I'm showing you. You'll notice a little bit of differences in their body shape, um, but they're all kind of serving the same kind of ecological role um, in, in the lakes where they, that I, they inhabit. Okay, so we'll do a little breakdown of the two strategies here that they can do. And again, let's think about trade-offs. Um, so sexual reproduction gives you genetic variety. Um, you get those hardy resting eggs, which, which can hang around for a while. So they're kind of like insurance for the future. You get a little egg bank going in the lake you're on, you know, after many, many years. And that really um, retains your genetic diversity. And kind of, like I said, make sure that the population as a whole has some, um, has lots of different genes floating around in it. And some of those might confer an advantage in feeding, or they might um, help you resist a parasite or something. But again, that sexual reproduction, you only get two eggs from it, takes time and energy. Think about this, the female also has to um, feed and take in enough nutrients to produce the casing for the eggs too. Asexual reproduction is fast and cheap. Um, when times are good, they're really good. You can always switch to sexual reproduction, but overall, if you, if you rely too much on asexual reproduction, um, the population is more vulnerable. Um, so actually, and Daphnia have a specific bacterial parasite um, that you know cause, can be very problematic for them. It will grow inside their digestive tract and eventually kill them. Um, and so, if you're only producing asexual, um, if you're only using asexual reproduction, eventually that par that bacterial parasite. Um, remember, bacteria are really good at evolving. Um, we'll probably find a way to take advantage of your particular um, genetics and decimate the population. So actually, there have been some studies. Um, if you find, a, if you have a population of, there's, or, sorry, there are some populations of Daphnia that um, are, have lost the ability to reproduce sexually. And so they're living isolated, maybe in a mountain lake somewhere. And those populations don't tend to last very long. Um, so you kind of need both. Um, because you need the sexual reproduction to keep switching around genes um, 
to kind of evolve against the parasite that's constantly evolving to attack you. And so that's something ecologists talk about as like an evolutionary arms race where you basically have to keep evolving because you're pitted against an enemy that's also evolving and you can't afford to fall behind at all. Okay, so Daphne here, um, number of offspring, you know, you get uh, five, about five from asexual reproduction, but keep in mind that that can happen very quickly, many times over the course of a season. So you get that exponential burst of growth. Um, and then at the end of the season or when times are not so good, move to sexual reproduction, which is a little more expensive for the number of offspring you get, but it's insurance for the future. As far as obstacles, I'll point out that we have a spiny water flea now in the Madison area lakes, which is a very effective predator on Daphnia. Um, and also that arms race kind of going on with the bacterial parasite where um, Daphnia need to evolve constantly. So imagine a situation where you have an egg that hatches from 1936 um, and those Daphnia come into the water and they happen to be really good at resisting this parasite. Well, in that case, they can use asexual reproduction to absolutely explode. They'll do really well because um, maybe the parasite is around a lot that year and that lineage um, survives really well. But then um, at the end of the season, you have a ton of asexually produced Daphnia with this resistance, and then they sexually re reproduce, and now you have those genes mixed in with the rest of the population for the coming years. All right, our last critter today is the bad guy, um, zebra mussels. Um, probably one of the most successful, well-known invasive species in North America. A lot of effort has been put into slowing or stopping their spread with kind of mixed success. Um, we know they're so successful in certain lakes when the conditions are right, they need calcium to build their shells. Um, but they'll just filter tons and tons of water to get their food. Um, they will, so they're filtering water from the water column and basically excreting that, um, the results of that on the bottom of the lake. And the effect overall is to remove things from the water column um, things like phytoplankton, um, and then just put all that nutrients at the bottom of the lake. And that is a pretty dramatic change from a lake without zebra mussels. It's all gonna depend on, um, again, the calcium and um, whether there's enough hard substrate for them to attach to. So really, um, it's difficult to predict the effects of zebra mussels on any one particular lake. Um, we're in luck in you know, with Lake um, Mendota and the Ahara chain here that we already know a lot about these lakes. So I think um, we're actually better off than um, if we hadn't been studying these lakes already and zebra mussels got in. So, so we're still kind of working out the ecological effects of, you know, a large scale zebra mussel infestation on a lake and how that changes nutrient cycling and all that stuff. But you also notice they're a problem because they just attach to stuff. So that instrument on the left was in the Great Lakes measuring current velocity. And now you can imagine that that instrument is not quite as accurate as it once was. And you can imagine this would be a huge problem if you get zebra mussels on an intake pipe for industry or otherwise. Um, they can close up that pipe and cause a lot of problems. And this is a pretty interesting picture, um, just to give you an idea of how these things will set up shop just about anywhere. Um, this is a dragonfly larva um, that has zebra mussels growing on it. And this is not, you know, the mussels didn't maliciously seek out this dragonfly and try to kill it. Um, but the survival of this particular dragonfly is probably reduced at the moment. Um, and more commonly, you'll find them just absolutely overwhelming um, and smothering native mussels too. So um, start thinking about their biology. Um, zebra mussels cannot move, so they're already going to need a different strategy than the fish and the Daphne we've talked about. Um, once they're adults, they attach to something and they stay there. Um, and then they release, release eggs and sperm into the water. Um, those meet and form a little floating thing called a veliger, and that which is microscopic, and that's what these are. The thing about the veligers, like kind of larval stage of zebra mussels, is that they can move. So they have a little bit of ability to kind of choose where they're going to um, attach to and spend the rest of their lives. Um, so, so far, this strategy kind of looks 
um, similar to the other ones we've seen where they kind of produce a lot of sperm and eggs and say, good luck kiddos, um, with even, you know, obviously no parental involvement whatsoever. Um, but it, it gets more interesting than that. So zebra mussels in really all organisms have this dilemma of, you know, you take in your food, which are those green dots on top, and you can either use it for growth or reproduction or both. And by growth, I mean the energy and material it takes to just maintain your current body shape and size um, and what you need to continue growing. And then reproduction would be things like producing eggs or sperm or any specialized structures you need to reproduce or investing energy to go and find a good place to reproduce, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is a, you know, a very common um, dilemma that, that organisms face. Um, and also as far as reproductive investment, zebra mussels um, release their eggs and sperm over several weeks during the mid to late summer, and they can actually lose up to 50% of their body weight during that time. So they, they can make a very heavy investment in reproduction. But um, when times are good, um, they're getting a lot of algae, which have um, lots of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So like high energy molecules there that they can use, um, use for their own growth and reproduction. If times are good, they can do both. They can grow and reproduce. And for a zebra mussel, it's important to grow so that you can produce more sperm or eggs the next season, but also it makes you less uh, vulnerable to low oxygen. And that's, some, that's a condition you might experience if you're sitting at the bottom of the lake. There's um, a good chance that there's some times where oxygen will drop um, as the, the lake is stratified and oxygen from the atmosphere can't reach there. So it pays to invest in growth um, for the future. Okay, but what if food quality goes down, represented by the kind of darker green circles? So if food quality goes down, it becomes a more difficult choice, right? You can't move, so you're basically stuck with eating whatever algae um, is, is most abundant at that time, and that can change very quickly. Um, just one particular um, type of food will uh, multiply very quickly. Again, conditions changing in the lake over the season. It's difficult to predict which one's going to be successful. So zebra mussels can't really count on um, having good food all the time. So this is where the zebra mussel actually does something kind of noble. Um, if food quality deteriorates enough, um, again, it's pretty amazing. They can sense the food quality um, temperature in the water, things like that. And they take all that information and make a decision about where to put their energy. And they'll actually choose reproduction over growth. And basically they're saying, well, I, conditions are not so great. I probably won't survive long here, um, but maybe my offspring will because they have the ability to potentially find somewhere better to live. Um, as, you know, zebra mussels are not very long lived. So it quickly becomes, um, an obvious choice to give your offspring a chance rather than trying to survive yourself. And this ability to allocate energy to different goals, depending on the conditions, is something that has evolved to help the muscle um, be so successful. And of course, no discussion of zebra muscles is complete without mentioning that, you know, we have a we have the ability to try and control the species. Um, you know, make sure you're that you're removing plants from your boat. And really what you're doing there is um, getting rid of um, any, well, plants themselves can be problematic, but you know, in this case, these little villagers can survive um, outside of water for a while. So it's really important to dry your boat off, remove all plants and obvious things. Um, and also, you know, just anytime you're taking a boat between different waters, be very, very careful. You really wanna um, either totally dry that boat out or use some sort of solution um, to clean it depending on what species you could potentially be moving. So it's always good to check the invasive species in a lake you're going to um, and think carefully about where you're going next. Um, and, and Clean Lakes Alliance and a lot of organizations across the state are, are doing a really great job to help educate everybody on this. I'm sure everybody here with the boat has heard of this before because I know that um, a lot of the organizations are putting a lot of effort to educating folks, which is really great. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll close out our chart here thinking about zebra mussels. So they're producing a, a lot of eggs and sperm, very low survivals for individuals, but um, the adults will sacrifice for the offspring to produce more of them. 
and they have this mobile larval stage, um, which is very problematic for us humans um, because they have the ability to survive out of water and hitch a ride on us. Um, so I'd say the biggest obstacle to their success right now is responsible boaters. Um, so kind of summing things up, um, I hope today that you um, learned some, some fun things, um, maybe got some good jokes out of it. Um, and, you know, when we think about the diversity of life on earth, it's really important to consider um, reproductive strategies because um, evolution is all about passing on your genes, right? So um, there's all these really interesting strategies that evolve um, because the obstacles that are placed in, in the way of these organisms and, you know, the organisms here have been around much longer than humans. Um, and these strategies were developed over millions and millions of years of trial and error. Um, and it's just amazing how unfamiliar some of these strategies are to us. But when you take a look at it, it really seems to work out, um, or at least you can understand how that strategy evolved in the past. Um, so that concludes um, what I've prepared. I know that um, I think Adam's been monitoring the chat for Q&A. Um, so I think I will turn it over to him. Hey. Hey, Justin. Uh, fantastic talk. We have uh, some great uh, questions that came in from the chat and from the Q&A. So um, if, if you have any that are going to come up while we do this, um, please fire them in there and we'll, we'll try to get you as many as possible. We've got a good 15 minutes, which is awesome. So um, one, I just want to check out. I, I thought this was funny um, or not funny, but it was interesting. Uh, Justin, what is the plural of Daphnia? It's like Prius, like you see a bunch mm. of Prius and Prii. Well, I'd, so Daphnia is the name of the genus. So I think you can say, look at all those Daphnia. Like and that genius. could either mean a bunch of individuals or several or two members of different species. OK. So it, I don't it, know how you'd say singular Daphnia. It, it was, it was an, I just thought it was an interesting question. because those are the kind of things that I think about too. <laughs> so uh, uh, very good. Okay. Uh, saying on the topic of Daphnia, uh, somebody else said for the egg banks, what triggers the older eggs to finally hatch? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, so the part of the strategy is that it is kind of randomized. Um, cause if they, if every single egg hatched the next spring, um, then you wouldn't have any for the next year, right? And so, so the kind of randomness of them popping up is part of the strategy. And I personally, I don't know, um, but I would bet that there's, they are, it's, it's amazing the way these organisms can kind of cue into stuff that we don't notice. So there is a way that they will know that it's at least a, there's a pretty good chance that we can hatch right now. I don't know if there's, if they ever make a mistake and maybe they hatch in the middle of the winter. Right. but I would bet that there's a way that they know that it's springtime and right. that might be a chemical signal. Um, I can't imagine that they're sensing light at the bottom of the lake, but that's not also not, I mean, they're buried in sediment too. So I would bet that it's the chemical thing. Interesting. Um, moving over a little bit on bluegill, which were really interesting. And I, I feel like maybe I've seen this, but do you have any recommendations where you can specifically see the bluegill nest colonies on our lakes? Is there a real good spot? I think, um, well, it kind of, it, it will probably change a little bit year to year, but basically um, they're looking for places that aren't super covered in aquatic plants. Um, so kind of like gravel beds or little, or, or even finer than gravel, like pebble sized things or sand too. Um, so you might be able to see those spots um, earlier and kind of note them, but it is going to be close to shore. Um, so I'd say if there's a place, I know I've really see, seen them along the bay, but some, you know, whether the bay has weeds in it is kind of depending on the, how the spring is going. Is there anywhere you've seen them specifically that you remember like, oh, I saw them? Well, that's, a, that, I think I've seen them on the bay, on Monona Bay. Um, and I think I've seen them in, on Lake Wingra from a canoe. Um, so if you can get in a canoe, you can kind of slowly, you know, coast over some of the, you, you can get to more shoreline because it's not very accessible there, but that's what I would say. Um, a couple of zebra mussel questions. Um, 
in this actually maybe even relates back to the bluegill, do those razor sharp zebra mussel shells make it more difficult for the bluegill to create their nests? I don't know about the, the sharpness in particular, but I know that if, if the zebra mussels were covering an area, as we've seen them, you know, the densities that they can achieve on some hard substrate, which would, which is, that is where the bluegill would like to nest, they are such that I don't think anything else would try to um, nest there. Right. So yeah, potentially problematic. Um, so we'll have, you know, maybe, a, maybe monitoring bluegill nests would be a good idea to see how, uh, see if we can see where they're going and whether they're threatened by that. Sure. So a couple of questions I'm going to kind of bundle together here again on zebra mussels. Um, and I'm just going to, I think you'll be able to kind of answer it all together. Someone wanted to know if um, any fish are learning to eat zebra mussels besides white fish in the Great Lakes. Um, and then someone kind of asked this, a couple of people asked the same question, is there anything that's keeping ze the zebra mussel population kind of in their natural range or you know is anything is there a natural enemy that's kind of keeping them in check yeah i guess i i i am not sure about that um i know that that's um a really active area of research um but they aren't they're basically not the best <laughs> prey um so i would imagine yeah um bas basically i'm not sure um, I'm not aware of any uh, species here that are really chomping down on them. Um, I think, you know, I mean, part of their strategy is to be, they're small, they're difficult to eat. You're not going to get a lot of nutrients out of them for the effort of getting through their shell. Um, I think, you know, in, um, in the lakes here, there's the idea that because we don't, it's not a totally bare rock bottom. So that might limit how many zebra mussels we can, um, just the lakes can support in total just by where they can settle. Um, but that's also still kind of an open question. Um, and I, I, uh, yeah, I wish I had more information on, on, um, on that. Cause I know that's a definitely an area of active research. All right. I'm going to stick with zebra mussels here for a few minutes because we had a couple other great questions and I'm going to try to kind of bundle together. Somebody said that they noticed muskrats, um, were eating zebra mussels and wondering if they have any other, predators besides the white fish. And then someone kind of asked along the same, you know, are there, is there a way to kill off the zebra mussels without a bad downside? You know, you can't just dump gasoline in the lake and <laughs> get everything out of the issue. But so is there anything else besides the muskrats eating them? And then, you know, is there a downside to do a big kill? Yeah. Um, I really hope the muskrats are eating the, the zebra mussels. That's really fascinating. Um, I would, I would maybe, I, may, I might Google that after and see if that has been observed elsewhere because that might be somebody else might be interested in knowing that. Um, yeah, I mean, with the zebra mussels, you know, the something, you know, things that I'm sure come to mind are like a, a chemical or something because they filter so much water. But again, if you, there's a danger of, you know, placing wide, a chemical in the lake, could have all sorts of unintended consequences. And then if you kill all the zebra mussels at once, you have a bunch of decaying organic matter at the bottom of the lake and in those spots where they are. So that that has, again, potential consequences that we probably be difficult to predict. Um, One of our uh, volunteer monitors, Arlene Koziel, said that she's seen diving ducks eat zebra mussels. So yeah, um, that's, I would, I would totally believe that. Um, and I think the question is whether they can um, maybe they're already doing the work of keeping the population lower. And I think, you know, that's the kind of thing that we have the potential to study really well here in Mendota and the other Madison Lakes, because um, we already know so much about them that maybe um, we can find out why zebra mussels are succeeding or not here by kind of tracking things like that. And, um, you know, what other species we have here that maybe they don't have other, other, places. Sure. Um, I'm going to jump back over to bluegill sale real quick. And I don't want to get onto some of the, on the northern and musky, but uh, somebody actually made a comment and said a few years ago, they had a nest near their pier on uh, Lake Monona, Pier 15. Um, so on that part of Lake Monona, they had a bluegill nest. And somebody had a question saying, um, 
what is the difference between the sneaker male and the female mimic that was in the back of the photo? That's just uh, an age difference. So if you start out as a sneaker male, you will become a female mimic. And it's just like a continue a way to continue that strategy even as you get bigger. Um, so the, yeah, they, they adopt the coloring of the female and uh, yeah. Um, someone wanted to know if Northern and Muskie crossbreed with each other at all. And if so, are their offspring capable of breeding? I do not know that. Um, I know that there, you know, there's the tiger Muskie hybrid. Um, so that's the result of crossbreeding. Um, so yeah, I think they, they, they can crossbreed. I don't know about um, the survival of the young. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm almost certain that the tiger muskie is a is the hybrid between northern and muskie. We got um, a panelist that said tiger muskies are sterile, so maybe they aren't. There we go. I'm not a fish biologist, so I'm glad we got, <laughs> hey, we got some people you know, in the of, chat uh, there. A lot of people with a lot of uh, great knowledge on this. Um, uh, Luke, from our uh, staff had asked me this question earlier, and my guess is he maybe knows, but it's a good Are you question. playing favorites? Uh, <laughs> he wanted to know if the, the lock and dams on the hard chain negatively impact pike reproduction, and are there alternative fish passage options? So again, it's really going to depend on that particular, um, just that, that time of year um, where they're looking to spawn. Um, and, you know, we know that they will, the, the muskies will try to jump the dam at Wingra. They're not always successful, but, um, you know, an option there might, I think if, the, you know, they'll, they'll be able to get over a little bit of a lip. Um, but also that kind of makes the argument for having spawning habitat kind of distributed throughout the chain, right? So you don't want to have all your spawning habitat right in one place, um, in one lake where everybody has to get there and then compete for space. So that's kind of an argument for having multiple options. I also, um, the kind of the habitat I was showing earlier is really like very prime pike habitat and they will try to spawn other places. It's not like they'll give up. Um, but, you know, if I, if I was um, thinking long-term, I'd want to provide some areas of really prime habitat and then protect other widespread areas of kind of moderately good spawning habitat. Sure. Um, try to get to a couple more here before time runs out. Uh, a great question. Do you fear um, a collapse of, you know, local game fish as the spiny water flea consumes the daphnia, which smaller fish feed on, and then so on up the chain? Is it, could it, is there a foreseeable collapse in game, local game fish? I, I'm not a fish biologist, but um, I think that it's unlikely to have a, a total collapse. I think it will be a year to year thing. Um, just like other zooplankton, like the spiny water flea um, is going to have good years and bad years. Even in a good year, I don't think they're going to do enough to cause something that would uh, like totally collapse the ecosystem for many, many years to come. Um, but it's definitely something that we want to keep an eye on and think about um, the same kind of thing, like try to find out, is there anything that's eating these? I know there have been studies where they look at the, the diet of fish and they've found spiny water fleas um, in their stomach, but it's the question of, well, how nutritious is that? Is that bad for the fish to eat so many? Cause that spine is really hard to digest, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the same kind of questions with zebra mussels. Great. A um, couple more here. Is somebody want to know, is there any direct competitive activities between the four species beyond just eating each other? Is there? It, yeah, I'm, um, well, so Daphnia are part of the food chain. Um, I think young bluegill might feed on Daphnia. Um, the young of any fish of, of a very small size will probably go after them. Um, is there anything else besides just eating each other? Besides though? eating each other. Um, because there, is temperature having anything to do with it or is there anything else that's causing them to compete for? Well, the one thing I'll say is that, again, the zebra mussels just change the ecosystem or have the potential to change the ecosystem fundamentally by altering water clarity and where the nutrients are. So if the lake is all getting filtered very quickly, again, it's taking stuff out of the water column and putting it at the sediment and that could impact food chains um, for the fish. 
I'm going to fire one more to you here. Are there any concerns that overfishing could disrupt the reproduction strategies? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's definitely possible, but I know that um, anybody managing a fishery would be aware of those critical periods um, for bluegill and pike. And, um, you know, especially in the Madison area lakes, I think overfishing uh, of, of bluegill, um, it's always, there's always the potential to, to go too far in that direction. But um, I think, you know, yeah, anybody managing the fishery is going to be aware of, of the, the, the times and the, um, you know, they're, they're doing population studies to look at the size of, of the fish and they count how many bluegill are this size, how many are this size, and they take into account this, you know, a big, big fish are more likely to spawn successfully. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's something that you need to think about with the management. Sure. Well, we're at nine o'clock and I want to be respectful of everybody's carved out Zoom time for the day. Uh, so Justin, we want to thank you so much again for, uh, gosh, just a fantastic topic and, and really interesting. We had a lot of great questions. Um, uh, and I know that, um, this has just become a favorite of ours having this uh, love in the lake. So, so thank you very much. Very interesting. I mean, it's, it's fun to, you know, laugh about a little bit, but definitely an interesting topic. I'm hoping everybody can join us next month. Mark your calendars. This one will be really interesting as well. Um, well, they're all interesting, of course. Um, Wednesday, March 10th, our Clean Lakes 101 Science Cafe will feature um, Dane County Executive Joe Parisi. Um, Kathy Coons, from, she's the director of the uh, Office of Energy and Climate Change. And then John Reimer, who is a stormwater engineer. Uh, with the county they are going to talk about um, sort of healthy land healthy waters all these great things that are happening in Dane County um, that the county is helping out with um, suck the muck is a is a very uh, popular uh, buzz term project you've probably heard the name of um, removing some legacy sediment to try to help keep that legacy sediment from making its way into the lakes and uh, you know we're always excited when our, our friends from the county join us and, and give us a an update. So, so mark your calendar for this one. You, you really won't want to miss it. Um, other than that, uh, again, as we said at the top, if you haven't, uh, if you have donated to become a friend or lake partner, thank you so much. We really are able to use those funds and continue these talks as well as um, some educational programming outside of here, some lake projects and our volunteer monitoring. If you haven't become a friend uh, or lake partner, cleanlakesalliance.org slash donate. We'd, we'd really love you to um, join us and, and, and help continue uh, the work that we all are doing together here. Um, that's all we have this morning. Uh, thanks so much. Stay warm and, and have a great Wednesday. <laughs>